thanks for joining us tonight for kind of our, or in the morning, depending on where you are in the world, uh, for kind of the last event of day three. Um, I'm Laura Wilson, and I'm going to be the moderator for this panel. Um, and first, I'm just going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves, um, who you are, where you are, both in your career and also physically, um, in terms of where you're working, what you study. And since this, this uh, panel definitely has kind of a methods twist to it, um, we'd love to hear kind of some of the methods that you're implementing in your research now. So I'm just going to start with who's on my screen um, in order. So Stephanie, we're just going to start with you. All right. Um, my name is Stephanie Drumheller. I'm a senior lecturer in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences at the University of Tennessee. My research is, is primary taphonomic. So everything that happens from when an organism dies until when we find it. And I am applying a lot of different stuff at the moment, though I guess my ongoing projects, a lot of them are, are heavily on the actualistic side of things, which is about as low tech as you can get. Um, mm -hmm. I have a graduate student with a bunch of dead tegus in a field right now um, over to things like looking at CT scans to, to pull apart exactly what's going on in the insides of fossils as well. So a lot of different angles, I suppose. Excellent. Well, hopefully we'll have a chance to break some of those apart. Um, Armida, you're next. Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Armida Manosara. I'm a postdoc at Yale University right now. Um, my research is focused on the evolution of joints, hips, knees, ankles, heads. It's all good. Um, and a, on the paleontological side, I've spent a lot of time developing methods for reconstructing joint mobility and joint function from the fossil record. Uh, and I also do a large amount of x-ray reconstruction of moving morphology. So taking x-ray videos of living animals to get extant data into our fossil studies. Very cool. And Yara. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Yara Haridi. I'm a postdoc at UChicago. Um, I study sort of like the different kinds of biomineralization in vertebrates. Basically, why are we not piles of goop uh, and how we grow and how much of that even preserves in the fossil record. So my primary methods are different types of imaging from traditional histology, cutting fossils up, to synchrotron, CT, uh, and then I've developed some, or novelly like applied new methods to look at cell spaces and cell structure in really ancient fish. Um, and now I've been dabbling in Evo Devo. So I'm raising embryos and all kinds of other weird ways to tell why our bone works the way it does, both in deep time and now. Excellent. Well, I think we have a, a great breadth of research methods and areas to which we apply our, um, our methods. So I'm excited to get this started. Um, so I'm just gonna start uh, kind of one of the questions that was put forth in our, in our planning chats of paleontology can be highly disciplinary. Um, and so what are some of the techniques and methods derived from other disciplines that you incorporate into your own research? Um, Stephanie, I'm going to start with you on this one. Okay. A lot of the, the methods that I've been using, honestly, uh, come from anthropology. So in the study of taphonomy, obviously, I'm using these methods to try to answer paleontological questions, but there's an awful lot of overlap with fields like zooarchaeology and forensic anthropology and paleoanthropology. And uh, unfortunately, we, we sometimes silo ourselves and we only look at research and papers within our own disciplines. And especially on the taphonomic side of things, you can sort of follow the reinvention of the wheel a couple of times in some taphonomic research where if we had all just been reading each other's stuff, maybe we'd all be a bit further along down the path. But a lot of the actualistic methods that I use, the, the framework for looking at how things decompose, how they end up buried in the first place, uh, were really pioneered with mammalian research on the anthropological side of things. So I'm, I'm a big fan of interdisciplinary work and, and reading and reaching out to colleagues in other disciplines because a lot of us are, are working on the same type of, of data, even if the questions we're getting after are perhaps a little different. I love that answer. I remember the first taphonomy class, okay, only taphonomy class I took during my master's. And, you know, we had uh, one of the students in the class pulled literature for us to read and it was from archaeology. 
And I remember thinking like, wow, they're, they're ahead of us on this. Like the amount of detail that they put into their data collection and ex excavations is pretty phenomenal. Um, so that's super awesome. Um, it's funny Yara, it's so yeah. Oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's funny how my career trajectory worked out because basically what happened is I, as an undergraduate, I had already been accepted to grad school. I already knew where I was going, but I needed one more class to take as a distributive requirement. And I was at the University of Tennessee and I said, well, it's internationally renowned forensics program. Let's go take that. And it really did completely change the trajectory of, of where my career went. And it didn't come from within my discipline. It was a completely random distributive requirement. That's awesome. Um, Yara, I'm going to ask you the same question. And I know that like you, you're applying a lot of different methods. So maybe, maybe you can just pick one or two um, for, for how you get kind of techniques and methods derived from other disciplines. For sure. Um, so, I mean, like you said, I do a lot of different things, but two of them are kind of obvious and one is less obvious. So histology, obviously, that's used a ton in modern animals. And we understand a lot of that from the modern uh, extant literature. And then similarly, Evo Devo is almost ex you know, it's basically exclusively for extant animals. So that obviously comes from that side of biology. But the weird one that I kind of got excited about just in the past couple of years happened completely by accident. And it was um, when I was collaborating with some material scientists and I was walking down the hall in uh, one of their offices and I saw a poster that looked like a piece of bone with osteocytes and I'm like what are you guys doing with that uh and they're like that's not what that is you dummy uh it's a chunk of battery that's corroding slowly and then we like image it in a special way to like figure out the pores and I was like hold on what is the scale and it was like cell sizes and below so I was like what are the chances I can put my specimen in your machine pretty please <laughs> and they basically said does it explode and I said no and after that Basically, we had the best images of osteocytes from like deep, deep time and figured out the sizes and how interconnected they are. And that's all because I saw their poster and they knew how to use this machine. And it's a method called FIB SEM. It's basically an SEM, which many of us have used, but it's on a like sub micron scale and it's serially sectioning as it's imaging. I don't know why paleontologists didn't know about this. I mean, they've used it for chemistry, but never for imaging. But it's just that next step by meeting a different scientist who's applied it a different way. And yeah, walk through your different campuses or departments hallways. You might, you might figure something out that's useful for you. So that's my one piece of advice. That, that's a great story of discovery. Um, I love that. I think I remember maybe hearing that in your, your Romer talk. Did you tell yeah, a little bit yeah. about your Romer? Yeah. Um, that was great. And one of the things, so, uh, so disclaimer, I do histology as well. Mm -hmm. um, in a much more traditional method. But one of the things that's fascinating is obviously we're, we rely heavily on modern animal histology, but I feel that it's pretty almost exclusively the paleontologists that do it. They're not a whole lot of modern biologists that are cutting up their extant animals. Um, so I feel like we're doing a lot of that on extant animal as paleontologists. Um, I think the one sea turtles are kind of the one area that I've I found where people are actively like conservation biologists are actively cutting up those animals. It's also pretty common in um, salamander conservation because okay. the only way you can actually cool. tell how old they are they take off their toe ouch but it is what mm -hmm. it is and then they do histo on the toe and count lags. Um, they also do it in fish conservation because the ulus, okay. um will yeah. also you know give you age so but yeah you're totally right not for like just the average like let me just check out how old this thing is <laughs> right. it's not super common right you know because they, they can do things like observe them with their lives exactly <laughs> excellent um armina i'm gonna ask the same question to you in terms of um kind of uh interdisciplinary techniques and methods that you've um put into your research yeah sure so i mean doing functional work obviously i'm pulling a lot from extant animal comparative biomechanics, engineering, human orthopedics, but there are also, like Yara pointed out, some unexpected things that come up just from the path your research takes and who you end up speaking to. Um, so some of the more interesting ones I've gotten into 
I had this whole foray into mathematical topology and cartography map making to solve this like quantitative problem of how we compare joint mobility among animals. So using the math underlying this old map projection helped us figure out how we could compare joint mobility in different extinct animals which was a fun twist. Um, and the other thing that I end up doing a lot of and the people who are really fun to talk to are computer animators. So it's a cool crossover because they're great to collaborate with in terms of a paleo art reconstruction perspective, but also in terms of how we're actually doing our scientific analyses for things where we're doing these X-ROM, X-ray reconstruction of moving morphology analyses, and we're animating the bones of living animals, and we're studying how they're moving to apply it to fossils. There's a ton we can do in terms of pushing those animations to the next level and using the animation software to collect data about how soft tissues might be deforming and other things. Um, so things like the techniques that are used to model clothing or flags or tablecloths in animation software end up being really useful for modeling ligaments on your extinct animal. So again, some expected things and some unexpected yeah. things. That's totally fascinating, you know, like thinking about the question, the obvious, the obvious like um, interdisciplinary nature of, of paleo has always been like, oh, the perfect marriage of biology and geology, but just kind of these stories of going beyond just that interdisciplinary nature um, is exciting. And I think really shows just how much further we can push the envelope just by looking at what other people are doing, how it can be applied. I remember, um, not, not to age myself, but I was a master's student in the mid 2000s when um, th like 3D scanning and 3D printing was just coming on the scene. And I remember looking at 3D prints being like, this is really cool. And I understand how it could be used for education and outreach. And, you know, it only took a couple of years before people kind of figured out the research, the 3D geometric morphometrics and stuff like that to apply to it. And it's been really fascinating to follow along. Um, so uh, kind of on the continuing on the theme of inter interdisciplinary trends within paleo, um, what are some of the ways, you already talked about this a little bit, um, so I'll start with you on this, but some are the, what are some of the best ways to meet other scientists, either in your field doing innovative things, or like some of y'all have already talked about, seemingly unrelated fields that have turned into like these really, really lucrative, uh, lucrative is not the right word, but really um, beneficial relationships. Uh, yeah, so I talked about this a bit already, which is sometimes you're collaborating with them for something completely different. Ask them about their research. Ask them about their colleagues' research. Ask them about what's the like, big problem in your subfield right now and have them explain it to you in the simplest way possible. You might have people, excuse me, you might have people that you could suggest to them and they might have people to suggest to you and those conversations are always useful. But I'm going to say to everybody here and, and to that question particularly, uh, the same thing I say to my undergrads, which is cold emailing is so helpful. You know, honestly, sometimes, you know, it's nice to work with people within your field, but let's say, you know, you're a fish paleontologist or something. It's also nice to just reach across. So like I look up people within my university who study like bone pathology and just see if I can, and then I cold email them. And most of the time, because we do such bizarre things, whether it's anything from birds to turtles or whatever, most medical doctors or other engineers or animators or anything are gonna like, it will catch them off guard that you're emailing them in the first place, put fossil in the title somewhere and you're probably gonna get a response, <laughs> but cold emailing is so useful. And people are looking for collaborations all the time, especially for things that they only need to do kind of a small part and you tell them like, here's how this fits into a much bigger story. People get really excited about that. That's great advice. I was I was doing, I'm trying to kind of break my research into conservation paleobiology, even though I do kind of Cretaceous a little bit deeper time than a lot of others. And I got that same advice from a conservation biologist of like, just awesome. email, you know, I was like, oh, well, I feel like I need to publish more and kind of like show people how things could apply. And they're like, no, just send an email, say that this is what you're doing. How can you help? Um, so I love hearing that echoed. That's great for me to kind of like give me that confidence for those cold emails. I mean, the worst thing um, that's going to happen is that they won't respond. Right. <laughs> which, which, you know, happens all the time. I exactly. have a whole list of emails that I haven't responded to yet. Well, me too. Um, yeah. So Armina, I'm going to, I'm going to um, add this one to you. You had fascinating stories about interdisciplinary nature. So kind of ways, if you have anything to add to the conversation about ways to meet and collaborate with, with other scientists and other fields. 
Yeah, I'll definitely reiterate Yara's point about cold emailing. I think that's been the most successful strategy for me by far is just finding people either at my institution or elsewhere and just sending them an email. And like she pointed out, you know, putting fossil or dinosaur or whatever in the title, it's easy to get a meeting a lot of the time for better or for worse. Um, to that, I'll add a couple of other strategies. One is SVP is great, but attending other meetings with other disciplines there is a great way to meet people, see them present their work and get it explained to you in a really nice way. Um, for a ton of what we do, I think a lot of paleontologists would benefit from coming to SICBI, the Society for Integrative and Comparative Biology meetings. There's a ton of really cool crossover and things that paleontologists are also interested that people are studying neontologically. So things like that. Um, and the last thing I'll add is just like, very, very deep literature searches with a lot of different search terms. So not stopping at like the first or second page of Google Scholar, but getting to page 40 or 45 or 50 and seeing where things are cropping up in other kinds of literature is just so stupidly simple now with access to the internet to not have to go through an entire library, but to sit at your computer and click through things lazily to like see whether people in other fields you might fortuitously find are doing similar things. But cold emailing number one, I would agree. <laughs> No, that's great advice. I know that I'm guilty of kind of stopping after a couple of pages where I'm like, oh, this seems less relevant and then change my search, search terms. Um, so I really like that. So I uh, extend this to you, Stephanie, if anything that um, you from your own work, you you think you can um, you want to add to the conversation. I absolutely agree with the cold emailing. I absolutely agree with going to other conferences. I would say even branch a little further afield, I, whenever I can manage it, I try to go to the crocodile specialist group meeting, which um, is honestly much more conservation and animal husbandry minded, but there's usually a couple of paleontologists there. And there've been some really interesting things I've learned in that context that would just never come up in a, a more sort of paleo or even anatomical, you know, traditional type of meeting. So things related to research into crocodilian uh, immune systems and how that's you know as an area of study where they're trying to turn this into medications but then I look at that and say well how far can we trace that down the fossil record um I'm gonna I'm gonna try to tell a social media story without you know naming the guilty party on this one I have a colleague that, that was uh sort of teasing me for being as active as I've been on different social media platforms and I told them you know it's it's a great way to meet people that are in your discipline that you've never met before. Maybe they don't go to the same conferences. Maybe they live on the other side of the world, but it's a great way to to interact with people. And I think to, um, to spite me, to prove me wrong, uh, <laughs> he made a social media account. He actually got on Twitter and made this account. And I think within a few weeks had had a researcher from Europe reach out and say, oh, you're the person that works on this really specific clade. Here's some fossils that we found that no one here can identify. Would you like to work on them? So I got this sort of shame-faced visit to my <laughs> office saying, okay, I guess that's useful. <laughs> um, but even, even reaching out within your own university can be really useful. Um, we were in the process of launching a new paleontology minor at UT. And so that really made us have to reach out to the other departments to get other classes listed because you have to have everybody's permission to do that. And you can find surprising connections just by going to other department seminars instead of your own some weeks, if anything catches your interest. So, I mean, obviously reach out beyond your own university, but also look a little closer to home as well, because you can find some surprising collaborations there too. Excellent. I think those are all great pieces of advice for anybody and studying anything, no matter what the technique or group of animals animals are. I've definitely noticed that in times when I become more active on social media, sometimes I'm quiet, sometimes I'm active, just the number of engagements um, or even like invites to do things definitely change. So there's a lot of Kind of power of collaboration that can be found there. Um, so I have a so one of the questions that I wanted to pose to the group and something that actually dovetail dovetails with the talk that I gave earlier this morning is kind of how our research, like when we're doing research um, during our dissertation during postdocs, we're obviously working at these big research institutions um, that that can support PhD projects. We have PIs and advisors that are writing. Um, big research grants. So given kind of the, the cutting edge techniques that often come with large price tags, 
uh, kind of what advice you feel like you can give researchers that might be transitioning into positions not in an R1 or not in a tenure track position, might not have a startup or the ability to write big NSF, NIH grants. Um, so so how to kind of transition um, into, into non-research one research budgets, but still keep your kind of research programs alive and innovative and collaborative. Oh, sorry. Um, sorry, Stephanie, I'll start with you with this one. Okay. Um, I have a couple different ways I can answer that because I, obviously the University of Tennessee is an R1, but I, I am not a tenure track professor. I'm on the lecturer path, so I didn't have a startup. And I was actually a part-time lecturer for the first several years that I was employed. So I got really good at, at doing research on a shoestring sometimes. But one of the things that seems to be a, a big push in many universities, not just my home institution, is this idea that we need to provide hands-on research opportunities for students and experiential learning for students. So you can sometimes find some pretty creative ways to get funding for research that you want to do if you're bringing students in and having them directly involved. So a lot of the work I've been doing recently with CT scans, um, I was able to get a, a research license from Dragonfly. So Dragonfly is a commercial product, but if you're a researcher at an institution, you can get a free license for them. They they charge if it's you know an industrial company or something like that. But for us, you can get a license for free. And I have been having students do a, a lot of that because it's it's nicely sort of put together where you can make this into a semester long little bite sized project that can feed into a larger project that you're working on. Then the students get experience doing research. Um, if if the students want it, I always uh, I encourage them to also submit abstracts or present at meetings. I try to fold them into the papers so they get a publication out of it so they can see the whole process. And at the same time, this is an area where the university has a pot of money that is just earmarked for undergraduate research projects. So you can reapply every semester and, and just help these projects along while also giving students a hand-on experience that they need to be successful in their own careers. And it's not always... Um, I was about to say it's not always paleo students. It's actually very few of, of the students that have worked with me have at least initially started within my own department. I'll just, anybody who wants to come work with me, I'm happy to bring them along. So I've had people from like the obvious ones are anthropology and ecology and evolutionary biology, but I had a dentistry student a couple of years ago who just really liked teeth and wanted to work on teeth and they didn't have to be human teeth. Like well, That's good because I don't work with human teeth. Um, but since the university had these systems in place, I was able to do that. Um, and then on a larger scale, I've actually had pretty good luck with experiential learning and undergraduate research grants writ large, not just within my own university. But there's there's also a lot of research that you can do that is still fairly low tech. Um, I mentioned that actualistic project that my graduate students working on right now. Um, the Tegus, we reached out to a government agency in Florida that's dealing with invasives in the Everglades, and they were more than happy to unload some of them over to us. And then a lot of what goes into that is just how do we build something to contain it so the local coyotes don't get after it. And beyond that, it's it's just physically showing up and making the observations day in and day out. It's not really technologically advanced, but it's an area that needs work. Um, so there's there's an awful lot out there that might not come with the same price tag, but you can still get some really cool work out of. You are muted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I think that's great that the, the idea that you don't have to always get this huge lump sum to be successful, that piecing together, you know, I mean, I don't know what your your budgets for undergrad at mine you know we can get up to like sixty five hundred dollars for a year project which is a pretty healthy chunk of money for you know new equipment consumables sending students to conferences um so i think that's great uh armita i'm gonna extend the same question to you in terms of you know how to translate our research out of out of kind of big nsf scale projects or budgets for sure um i mean I guess, fortunately for my research program, I haven't encountered that constraint yet, mm -hmm. but I have thought about it in terms of places I might end up. Um, 
I'll reiterate Stephanie's really great point that some of the software we use can be really low cost or free. So Autodesk Maya, which is the animation software we use to do the most cutting edge range of motion analyses we have is completely free to anyone at a museum or with a .edu address. It has completely free educational access. So between MorphoSource and free licenses, you can pretty much do a study for zero dollars, which I think is really incredible. Um, in terms of the uh, things that are kind of unavoidably expensive, things like the XROM projects that I do or the Evo Devo that Yara does, things that are just really, really costly. I think there are, that's just a place where collaboration is really, really important. Um, and so I think there's no reason why you can't still have those kinds of questions and collaborate with someone at an institution where it's more feasible to be applying those kinds of methods. There are also granting mechanisms in place to help those collaborations happen. So I've been involved in NSF or NIH grants specifically for primarily undergrad institutions, encouraging collaborations between those institutions and R1 to get people together and get funding going for those kinds of projects. So I think it's definitely it's not that you have to limit yourself, I think, to low cost methods if you personally don't have access to more expensive methods. And I think if the more expensive methods are the most appropriate ones for the questions you're asking, then really seeking out those collaborations and making them happen seems like a really productive path forward. Excellent. Um, so Yara, uh, see what you have to add. Um, I know that you use a lot of high tech stuff and, I, and Armita, just to kind of follow up on you, I love that you're thinking about it um, because that's the thing that I've talked about with students is, you know, trying to make sure they're not panicking about how do they translate um, if if they don't or don't want to end up in, you know, an R1 or a 10 year line. Um, but but Yara, I'd love to hear what you have to say on the topic. I mean, I definitely agree with um, with both Stephanie and Armida, like totally on point. Um, the only other thing I would say is there are ways to make the, the fancy stuff cheaper. Uh, if your university or you know, your institution allows it, like definitely used equipment is great. And if you have a machine shop on site, most of those people will actually take, like take a look at them and make sure that they're good to go or need, if they need oiling or anything like that. So I'm talking about like histology, for example. Histology mm -hmm. is probably one of the more, on the lower tech of things I do, because really all you need is a glass plate and some grit and a old saw. And most people now you can find them on like eBay used because some tinkering guy at some point really got into jewelry making. And so you bought everything <laughs> and then now it's on there for like 25% of the price. So if your university allows it, take a look at used machinery, um, especially for the practical stuff like that, it, you can get it really cheap. Um, other things on the higher tech, it's kind of interesting because it gets like, so Synchrotron and FibSCM the only people that can actually afford to pay for it are like car manufacturers, like plain battery manufacturers. The rest of us have to compete for the time. And that is based on how good your idea is. Like Armita said, if that's the best um, method for the question you're asking, you get pushed up the, the grant line. So you write these proposals. And I think on my second year of my PhD, I wrote up to like 15 proposals and then the world shut down. But beyond that, you can write a, a ton of proposals and throw all your different ideas, throw them with different collaborators, depending on the place, certain synchrotrons allow multiple submissions if there are different projects with different leads. So you can put different collaborators in and kind of put in kind of like multiple options for it. Um, so that's fun because then you're the only thing that you're really limiting by is having a decent computer that can process the data, which definitely can be pricey and then travel. Uh, and even travel, there are ways to circumvent it because thanks to COVID actually, a lot of places will just let you send in your samples. Uh, you get on Zoom and you tell them kind of the parameters that you think are gonna be good. They send you sample slices back and you talk with them and you can get it scanned overseas from home. So that also applies for FibSCM where you just, when you're collaborating with someone who's a material scientist who has access to that stuff, you get access. Um, so there's ways to definitely work around even the higher tech stuff, but you need like the in, and the in can be just collaborating with people or talking to people at different conferences. Um, Evo Devo is definitely one that I have no idea how to make more affordable yet. Sorry, those yeah. are my cats. Ah. But um, that one's difficult because it's just, you need so much infrastructure. So that's one where I probably rely on uh, more collaborative stuff and maybe you know, you go somewhere for a couple months and do your experiments at their lab and now you're collaborating and come back with the data, something like that. That's that's one that's definitely hard to streamline. All right. 
Um, excellent. And Yara, I love your point about used material. I mean, I sourced my entire Histo lab when I got to Fort Hayes State off of eBay um, because I was I didn't have a startup, but I did get an internal grant um, to help buy equipment. And, and like I prefer it anyways, my my PhD advisor with her big startup got all of like the brand, brand new like Bueller materials and I hated using them. I liked her old like 20 year old like grinding machine installs. So um, so yeah, so that's some some great advice. So we're at about 830 right now and I would actually like to take a break from us dominating the questions and open it to um, those who have joined us as to participate in this. Um, if you want to kind of raise your hand, we'll call on you. If you want to unmute, if you aren't comfortable doing that um, to ask questions, you can put them in the chat and I'll relay them to the to the panelists. Um, but if, if anybody in our audience has any questions or comments for the panelists, we would love to hear them. Um, so if nobody has questions right now, um, while people are thinking or typing or writing things down, um, I do have a I do have another question um, for all of you. And, I, and we'll, uh, Armida, we'll start with you. I'm trying to kind of give everybody first, second, third. <laughs> um, and just kind of what do you think paleo will look like in the next five and 10 years to 10 years? And what are you most excited about? A tough one. Um, I think we've hit on the theme of interdisciplinarity a lot. I think our field is definitely moving in an interdisciplinary direction. And I think that's a positive thing because I think not only can we learn a lot from other th fields, I think the perspectives from paleo can also do a lot for other fields. So something I encounter a lot in my work is thinking about paleo as kind of like a data reduction from the data accessible to other fields. From a biomechanical perspective, right, we're left with bones most of the time 3D if we're lucky and not much else. And so to think about what you can do with that information without the complexity of the data that you could get from a living animal, I think really forces you to question what assumptions you're making across fields. And so over the next five to 10 years, I'd really hope that that level of crosstalk increases and that not only are we gaining more from other fields, but we're also giving back to other fields in terms of our perspectives. And I think that would be a really great outcome. Excellent. Um, Stephanie, do you have an answer for the future of paleontology? I think that our um, remote sensing and and our, our microscopy tools like that, so visualization software is just improving by leaps and bounds. And I'm going to see, be very interested to see where that goes. Um, obviously, there's there's a lot of unfortunate stuff going on with with AI technology and the ethical use thereof, but um, I can foresee that being an incredibly useful tool moving forward once we sort of hammer out the correct way to use it. Um, I know I have colleagues who are, are already looking at it to help them with things like coding for analyses and handling really, really big data sets. So I think that that's going to be a tool that becomes more useful as we move forward. But at the same time, um, especially in paleo, we keep surprising ourselves. Uh, we keep thinking, oh, we'll never, we'll never see a fossil that preserves that, or we'll never have the technology that will let us look at this thing in the way that we want to. And then either a new, uh, a new find or a new piece of tech pops up and, and we're, we're sort of shameless cannibals in this discipline. We will happily run off with any method from any other discipline that shows up. I And I joke about that, but we do. If it's it comes up in engineering, comes up in any other science disciplines, whatever, we will happily run off with it. So I think there's still, there, there's going to be some more surprises on the horizon, I think, as well. Well, I think some of your research, your recent research is a, a great indication of that, you know, in terms of what you're doing with the soft tissue and the mummified dinosaurs and things like that. You know, it takes me back to Mary Schweitzer's stuff in the mid 2000s, where we didn't even think to look for soft tissue structures. And now we're doing a much better job in our, our fossil preparation and our analyses of looking at these things that 
we didn't think were possible to to fossilize. Um, Yara, I'm gonna, before we move to kind of the audience, um, Yara, just uh, ask you the same question in terms of what you think the, the future of paleo looks like for you. I'll echo both, uh, definitely. I think there's gonna be more interdisciplinary and I think the tools that we have will get sharper and better. And, you know, our, the, the giants uh, that we stand, who, whose shoulders we stand on could never think of the things that we're seeing today. And I think it'd be pretty ridiculous for us to be like, oh, well, this is the plateau. Like, here it is. We're special. We're at the plateau. Like, that's a little ridiculous. So um, I think it'll break all our brains to see what happens next. I think mm -hmm. uh, both the panelists talked about what they think is like for methods and general ideas. But I think also, maybe this will be controversial in a few years, but I really think there's going to be a weird like pull down pattern of like everything that we thought were like derived features as we now have better, better tools to look at them in some ways, at least maybe particularly for tissues, we're gonna find out that they're more and more primitive and a lot of things showed up a lot earlier than we thought. And that just seems to have been the pattern in the past five years. And I think it'll just continue in a really mm -hmm. interesting way where we keep finding things that we thought are brand new actually showed up earlier. We just weren't catching them, you know, for yeah. taponomic or for, locality reasons or maybe it just wasn't their time so i'm i'm looking forward to that yeah i love kind of shocking people with the just over the past year or two the changes about when we think endothermy evolved you know in terms of now it's like dinosaurs and now crocodilians are weirdly secondarily ectothermic and now they're the hypotheses that endothermic is like basal to the amniote node um so i i love things like that um, one of the things that I would add is that I feel like we're doing a better job of this in histology, um, and I'm not as familiar with other kind of sub-disciplines and methods, but actually going back and testing a lot of assumptions that we've been using for like the last hundred years. We cite some dead guy from, you know, the late 1800s because he had an unsighted sentence in a paper that was translated out of the original German, and we've just run with it. Um, yeah. So I love that. I feel like we're starting to go back and actually testing some of these base hypotheses and finding that they're false um, and kind of having to restructure a lot of our base knowledge and assumptions um, that we've we built off of that. Um, so I, I great like answer. At some point, at some point, we all kind of did the rabbit hole of like, who said that? And you like run mm -hmm. down the the citation rabbit hole until you find the original German or Russian and then you translate it and you're like that doesn't say that at all and then yeah. now like you have a whole research side of things that you have to deal with and you're like how do I put this in the paper that that like foundational sentence is not even right so. right yeah so excellent so I'm gonna I'm gonna go to our comments um so we have a question for from Eric about what would be the best options for someone who is currently in the process of, of applying for grad schools, but is looking for more experience. So I assume this is the kind of like add to a CV and, and kind of um, uh, find out kind of the direction of research they wanna go. Um, so I don't know if any of our panelists have something they wanna jump in on this one. Um, I always say volunteer. If you have a local museum or a local university that has even something remotely near, like if you're interested in like dinosaurs, go see if there's a bird lab, go see, you know, just anything that you can get your foot in the door of. And at the very worst, you're going to be like, that's not what I want to do. So <laughs> you can at least cross that off your list. Um, but most of the time people just fall in love with like, you know, their immersive experiences in the lab and just volunteer. If you have the time, if you have the privilege of like, giving away your time and doing that that is probably the best thing you can do for yourself if you already know that you want to go to grad school immerse yourself in any version of that system so you know what you have in store for you the next three to four to five plus years <laughs> yeah. um definitely I absolutely agree with that i always um especially if you are still in undergrad obviously the answer is going to be different if you're not in that context but um, we all have more ideas than there are hours in the day. So we can usually come up with student projects and, and help people try it out because paleo in the classroom is not the same as doing the actual research. 
So I, I always try to encourage students to try to get involved and see if you really do like it um, and see what the experience is truly like. And I know at least in my department, we are trying very hard to have paid opportunities for students because we know that um, volunteering is great and I volunteered and some people are not always in a, a place where they can necessarily do that. So we try to, whenever we can, pay the students for their time um, or at an absolute bare minimum, give them course credit, like upper level course credit that they can at least count towards things like majors. So we try to pay them back in some way uh, for their time and effort whenever possible. But the any experience that you can get is going to be incredibly helpful. And even if you are if you're not still at a university as a student, reach out to uh, any lo local university or museum and see if there's any opportunities there. And a lot of times the answer is going to be yes. Um, Armita, I don't know if you have anything to add. I think that pretty much covers it. The only thing I'll add is just I think building off of something Stephanie said, really seeking out a diversity of experiences to make sure this is what you want to do. So making sure you really want to pursue paleontology over all the other fields of research out there and grad school opportunities there are. And then within paleontology, there's such a breadth of different types of research experiences. So really figuring out what it is that excites you and what you want your day-to-day -to, -day to look like, I think can only come from trying out not just one research experience, but a variety and seeing which one you like and what you don't like as well. I think the only thing that I would add is that, you know, as as we're kind of changing what academia looks like and we're changing what the student experience looks like and what we're looking for in our colleagues going forward, that it's not actually all about research, too, that there are other skills that you can build things that have traditionally been called soft skills. Um, but, you know, like participating in even, you know, the virtual conferences, which I know is a lot more affordable than the face-to-face -face conferences, like it, participating in a lot of the professional development, um, whether it's a workshop, whether it's, you know, even just like sitting in on a diversity panel or things like that, that you can write about in cover letters that you can add to your CVs um, because things like diversity, equity, um, you know, justice are huge things that we look for, especially within the sciences and just kind of having that more holistic that that academia you know if you do end up here it's not just about research research is i'm not in an r1 so research is a very very small portion of my contract um, versus all the other skills that you need um so mel has a question are there barriers you needed to navigate and broadening your toolkit and how did you do it um, So <clears throat> it's all barriers. I mean, like every time you don't have a skill set, right, that is in itself a barrier. And the first barrier is that you don't even know about the method, et cetera, et cetera, and you find out about it. So that's like step number one. Uh, but then after that, I usually, so for example, like histology, I learned because I was lucky enough to have uh, PhD students in the lab that I was working at that did histology so they could train me. Great. That's like pretty low barrier to clear. The next, it would be like CT. So I found out that, you know, University of Texas Austin has their CT course and that's where I learned how to segment and how to scan and then learned the rest of it at um, University of Chicago. And so I was just lucky enough to have that there. So sometimes you kind of have to go with the flow as well as like what methods are already in progress in your lab, in your institution, in your immediate area. And if those are not the ones that you think you need to answer your question at all, um, then you can try to broaden a bit and look for workshops outside or see if you can do like a skills trade with other grad students. That's also something I've done. If that's some, like I trade histology, I'll teach you histology in like three to four days and you teach me how to do FEA or something like that. And people love doing that. So that's also a really good option. Um, and I wish we kind of had like a big, place where everyone can toss their hat like you know skill we'll trade this for food or something but or for another skill and then we can all like have kind of a matchmaking situation but you can also just do that on a smaller level you know you can cold email people again and be like I'm looking to learn this do you have students in your lab who are doing this you know I can pay for travel if you're willing to train me stuff like that there's a lot of ways to really learn these new skills and 
nine times out of 10, people are really willing to teach because then you can become a potential collaborator and you can become a potential reviewer. So those, you know, people want to teach you stuff usually. Um, it's just about being in the right place, right time and talking to the right person. Someone's going to, someone's going to be ready to teach you. Yara, I love what you just said about the skill trade. And now I'm like, oh my God, so many missed opportunities that I had. I mean, especially in grad school. I mean, you're never in a, there's never going to be a time when you're surrounded by the a variety of people doing different things all in the yeah. same area as when you're in a grad student, because then you, you know, like either become siloed at a university or, you know, there's not this, this perfect overlap. Um, so I love that. Um, and I try to do that to some degree with my students. I don't have time to train every student who comes to me to, who wants to learn histology, but if I'm doing a a project right then or I have a grad student doing something like come to the lab at this time on this day and you know like you can observe the process and we'll do it that that way um so so great great advice um our meter Stephanie do y'all have anything to add for navigating barriers to run your toolkit sure I think um like Yara said learning it directly from someone who knows it is obviously a really great way to pick things up um I think another strategy I've used is people are sometimes very generous with their supplementary material of their papers in terms of how much they're willing to actually explain how to do something, especially in terms of computational methods. So really digging into supplements has helped me a ton. If there's a paper that does something I want to know how to do and I don't know how to do it, I'll hope that they've said something or emailing those authors directly. And then even if it's something again, more on the computational side. If it's something that I don't know how to do and I don't know anyone who would know how to do it, there are a ton of great YouTube tutorials and blogs and weird forums archived from like the early 2000s, just all kinds of things all over the internet where people, especially when you're doing this interdisciplinary work, have posted things about how to do various types of methods. And so seeking that out online, if you don't know anyone personally or wouldn't even know where to start to look for someone can also be a really useful strategy. That's great. I have no hesitation to like Googling how to do something in like Photoshop or Illustrator. So there's no reason why that shouldn't apply to other other methods as well. Um, Stephanie? I don't have much to add to that. I mean, I, I yeah. if I don't know how to do it, I usually will try to find someone who I reach out as a, a potential collaborator, either to work with them directly or to have them help mm -hmm. teach me. And it's always it's always gone pretty well. Um, but also there are so many, like, so a surprising number of video tutorials out there attached with major analytical methods and computer programs that you can just, you know, buckle down, pull up your screen and start watching the videos and it'll walk you through it. So if you can't find a, a person to help you along, usually someone has, has posted something that you can find. I, I feel like we're also, I, I talk to this about my, to my, I talk about this to my students all the time that we're getting in a much better place just in the level of detail we publish in papers with our methods. You know, methods used to be shoved to the end or made as short as possible. I mean, we still put them in supplemental material, but at least when we do that, it's pages of methods. It's, you know, open access data and codes. So I feel like, you know, between more complete methods and papers and the power of the internet, like we are in a better place to self-teach some of these things so we're not going in blind or at least we have a base level of knowledge before we start talking um, to potential collaborators to, to get a little bit more in-depth information. Um, so all great advice. We have one more question in the uh, chat for now um, and it's do you see more international collaborations as uh, part of the potential future of paleontology? Armida, I see you nodding. Do you want to start this one off? Start. Um, I think this is something that COVID definitely did for my career is just when collaborating with anyone became a Zoom call, there was really no reason not to make that an international collaboration anymore, you know? And I um, picked up some really great collaborations during that time and I'm continuing to expand. So I think we've all gotten so used to video conferencing. It's so easy to hop on a call with someone and do things digitally now that it. I think I see it increasing, especially like when you go to SVP now, the author lists have become more and more international. And I think that's a really great thing. And I think that's a trend we should continue towards. So I'm hopeful that it is part of the future of paleo. Yeah. I've had a, a very similar experience, again, tying in with that 
social media aspect of thing where some of the people who have cold contacted me um, have been from other parts of the world and I have ongoing collaborations with them. And with with the internet, with Zoom, it's with you know the ability to do massive file sharing, it's just become so much easier that there's not really a good excuse not to. And uh, just because I do come from sort of a taphonomic background, and one of the things I've been looking at a lot recently is the collector bias side of things. How do we as researchers affect the underlying data set? Uh, it seems like the more research that is done outside of Europe and North America, the more we realize that signals that we used to think were global, were not, were sometimes regional, and we really do need to take a much more global perspective if we're trying to answer global questions. Um, so I, I think it's it's very necessary that that we start reaching out to colleagues who are all across the world to get these these big data sets and these big questions answered. We can't just stay in our corner and only look at the stuff that's right in front of us. Yeah, absolutely. And I agree with, with both Stephanie and Armida. I just wanna add that international collaborations have been a thing for in Paleo for a while, but I'm hoping that as they increase, they'll also be like more equitable in a way so that, you know, for a long time also paleo would just be you know just people show up and describe something or take it and you know tack on a few authors and I think that that's going to be changing also soon where you know maybe somebody from the global like north will just be doing a scan or something but everyone else is doing the interpretation so you know they end up getting tacked on as like one of the authors rather than the other way around so I don't know I, I just think yes absolutely we'll keep getting more popular and we're all getting more connected to one another, but I hope as we move forward, we'll also just keep that in mind in, you know, how to best collaborate across these oceans and across the different accesses that everyone has, whether it's to samples or whether it's to technology or funding, et cetera. So yeah, looking forward to it. I think it'll be good. I agree. Um, Armida, I think you, I think you nailed it a lot when you said that COVID changed a lot of things. And I think this is definitely one of the better things to come out of it. Um, you know, we have a, we have a, a handheld surface scanner, um, at the Sternberg where I am and just like being able to fulfill requests, people can't travel to see our specimens. Um, you know, some things are just too big to loan out, uh, but being able to send scans, you know, very easily overseas or around the country to researchers, you know, was definitely a way to still kind of help keep people engaged and on track. Um, and I think it's something that we're doing a much better job of realizing that it's pretty easy um, to work across borders. Um, we're coming up towards the end of time. Uh, we do have a question from uh, uh, one more from Brianda in the chat. And how or when did you discover the subject you're passionate about? Do you have any advice on how to find your specific field? I touched on that a little bit with mm -hmm. my first question, um, but I think the the unfortunate, the unhelpful answer is there is a, a little bit of serendipity to it. Um, I I got into taphonomy because of a random class that I took in undergrad, but then moving forward, especially when you're in graduate school and you could really immerse yourself in reading the literature, as you go along, you're going to start finding holes or you're going to start finding things that we've always assumed that something was happening, but nobody was really testing it. Uh, you're you're going to stumble across stuff that's going to make you stop and pause and think. And some of the most interesting rabbit holes that I've fallen down, I, I tripped over while reading a paper or looking for something completely different. So I know that's that doesn't really provide a roadmap other than just try to branch out and and uh, expose yourself to as many opportunities and as many different you know types of research as you can and just see what types of connections come to you because there's there's still an awful lot out there um, and there's an awful lot of unexpected things like hiding in the literature I guess. 
Yeah, in addition to literature, I would just say going to conferences like SVP and listening to a wide variety of talks, you know, it's such an easy condensed environment to get exposed to so many different topics in one day in one spot. And then to think about both what seems really exciting and also if there's anything that seems really frustrating where you find those gaps where you're like, how is it that we're just now figuring out this thing and there's so much more that we're supposed to know. So I know I've often had those very visceral reactions to conferences. And again, it's just so many things in such a concentrated time period that it really does give you that diverse flavoring of what's being done in the field so that you can kind of narrow in on what's interesting to you and what is less interesting. Uh, I would, absolutely. And I would just want to add that. Um, so the question is, how and when did I find it? Like, find, when did we find out what we're interested in? And I would say, like, just yesterday, as in <laughs> my interests change all the time. And I feel like in some ways, uh, a lot of the younger crowd or just people that aren't like settled into one thing, they're kind of rushing to find their niche. And like, there's no rush at all. I mean, you know, the fossil record, if anything, in some ways has told us what happens to specialists versus generalists. There is nothing wrong with starting as a generalist and then going from there. And I don't know, there's also not a problem with being a kind of a jack of all trades type situation. You can be good at multiple things and they cross communicate. So I particularly had a really hard time tying in all my weird chapters under one thesis in, for my PhD. And it all ended up being is the only common thing in between those is that they're hard parts of vertebrates. Okay, great. I study biomineralization then, you know, like you can make up your own kind of niche from the multiple things that interest you and they usually fall under something. Hyphenate a specialty. It doesn't really matter. Um, so don't be like in a super rush to find your like soulmate specialty. It, you'll stumble on it. Like Stephanie said, there's just a certain amount of serendipity. And as Armida said, it's those questions that like make you itch and be like, how do we not even know this? So you'll find it, but it just, it takes time and there's no real rush to do it. Try everything. I think one of the things that surprises my students the most is because I don't have a PhD program. I have a master's program is just like kind of this idea that what you do for your master's doesn't matter. Like it doesn't dictate your life. PhD does a little bit more just because you come out with so many more questions that you're like kind of engaged with them for a while after. But, you know, I, I tell my students all the time, like it's about learning the research and and I'm gonna, you know, use my, my PhD office made an example here. And they did like Mosasaur phylogenetics for their master's in a biology program and then they ended up doing stable isotope geochemistry on Eocene mammals in a geology program for a PhD and just like, you know, completely jumping ship on taxa and methods and era, um, you know, there, there's really nothing to stop you from learning new, new things, learning what you like and, and learning, uh, learning what you don't like. I, I can't remember uh, who that, who was that said it, that like, knowing what doesn't interest you is very important to figure out as well. Um, but overall, so thank you uh, for the wonderful questions um, from our audience. And thank you to our wonderful panelists um, for, for giving up some time and, and sharing their experiences. Um, feel free to, I'm gonna throw them here. Feel free to look them up if you have any questions about their research. Um, but this has been great. And thanks so much for participating and hope to see you all at some of the events tomorrow.